Hello Brighouse High School and welcome to this online tutorial which today is going to be focusing on fitness testing. This links very closely with the last tutorial we delivered on components of fitness where we're going to explore the purpose, methods and protocols of testing each individual component. So over the course of this tutorial hopefully you'll be able to match the 11, 11 components of fitness to their recognised test. You'll be able to describe how each test should be carried out properly. And you'll also be able to explain the issues around following correct test protocols and the reliability of the results that you get from each test. So fitness testing is a crucial part of any athlete's training program as it allows them to do a variety of things. The first thing it allows is you can get a starting level of fitness, what we call a baseline, so that you know the current level of fitness that you're starting at. It will also allow you to identify strengths and weaknesses within the components of fitness you possess. So which areas are you strong within and which areas do you need to develop? From that you'll be able to set your own goals and targets and hopefully monitor your progress in relation to achieving those targets. Fitness tests also allow you to compare your results to national averages or what we call normative data to see where you fit in relation to other athletes who've carried the test out. It may also allow you to alter your training program so that it is more specific and it has more benefits specifically to you and what areas you need to improve on. And lastly, it should motivate an athlete. By being able to monitor progress and compare your results to others, you will hopefully motivate yourself or motivate another athlete to continue to progress towards those goals. So, hopefully you are all familiar with the 11 components that are now on screen. What we're going to try and do here is see whether you can use your initiative to match the 11 components with the recognised tests that are now on screen. Some of these should be relatively straightforward. For example, speed would clearly be measured by using a sprint test, in this case the 30 metre sprint test. Others, slightly more difficult. But pause the video now and see if you can match the components to the recognised test just based on what's in front of you there. Right, having given that a go, let's see how you did. So the components and the recognised test have now been matched up. Starting at the top with cardiovascular endurance, this is measured using the Cooper 12 minute run or the Cooper 12 minute swim. All the way down to speed, which we used as our example, is measured using the 30 metre sprint test. Now we're going to go into these in a little bit more detail further on, but I just want to speak to you briefly about test protocols. Now test protocols are the rules and procedures that should be followed when athletes are carrying out these fitness tests. The rules and procedures make sure that the results are therefore reliable and valid and can be used effectively. Generally, for professional athletes, a sports analyst or scientist will carry these tests out with the athlete so that they can interpret the data and give feedback. When we do these fitness tests back in school, you will work with a partner who will act as this sports analyst and scientist and assist you in carrying these tests out. So let's delve into these fitness tests in a little bit more detail starting with cardiovascular endurance. So cardiovascular endurance is measured using the Cooper 12 minute run. There is a variation of this where you can do the Cooper 12 minute swim but we're going to focus on the run. The whole idea is that you complete as many laps of a 400 meter running track in 12 minutes. You measure the test in metres, so how many metres you run within that 12 minutes, and then that will allow you to compare your results to the normative data that's on screen now. So for example, depending on your age, if you are a 13 to 14 year old, anything above 2,700 metres in 12 minutes is classified as having an excellent level of cardiovascular endurance. Agility. Now, agility is measured using something called the Illinois Agility Test. And the idea of this test is that you complete the course as quickly as possible without making contact with any of the obstacles. The obstacles are cones that are laid out and you have to follow a particular running pattern around these cones 
and obviously do so within the shortest time possible. Speed, this is one of the most simplistic tests. This is measured using the 30 meter sprint test. From a standing or a static start, you sprint 30 meters in a straight line as quickly as possible. Now this is measured often with a stopwatch, but for professional athletes who do this, they will often use electronic time and gates, which improves the accuracy and therefore the reliability of the results. Strength is measured using the grip dynamometer test. This works by exerting maximum hand force onto this instrument by squeezing it as hard as possible. The harder you squeeze, the higher your result. The higher the result hopefully indicates you've got a higher level of strength. Power is measured using the vertical jump test. The vertical jump test is exactly that. You are trying to jump as high as physically possible and touch a marker which will determine how high you've jumped. Flexibility is measured using the sit and reach test. This works by placing your hands as far down a measurement box as possible while keeping your legs straight and flat on the floor. The further you can reach your hands along the box, the higher degree of flexibility you have. Balance is measured using the stalk balance stand test. And this requires the athlete to remain in a static balance position for as long as possible. As you can see on the images there, you see the starting position and the test position. That's the position you need to maintain for as long as possible. Muscular endurance is measured either using the one minute press up test or the one minute sit up test. And you have to try and complete as many press ups or sit ups in that one minute. Each successful press up or sit up is counted and then you can compare these to the normative data. As you know, Muscular endurance is generally used by athletes who use the same set of muscles over and over again, such as a cyclist or a rower. Now, body composition, measuring the ratio of fat to non-fat within the body, can be measured using a variety of different ways. The first is the body mass index calculator, or BMI for short. And this is a calculation using your height and weight to determine whether you're at a healthy weight. As you can see on the right hand side, these are the images that we use to calculate which category you fall within. Another method is skin full calipers, and this uses an instrument to measure the thickness of excess fat at key areas within the body. And lastly, we have body circumference measurements, which measures the size of key body areas such as the waist, the neck and the hip area. As we discussed at the start, we will talk about test protocols and the reliability of some of these tests. Particularly with body composition, there are a number of factors which can influence and deter the reliability of these results. So, on the note of protocols, we need to think about various different things of these tests. So, for example, how different athletes may carry these tests out. Take the press-ups for example, many people carry out press-ups in various different methods, various different ways. So we need to make sure that the press-up that each person is undertaking or executing is the same across the board. Measuring these tests, so here we have an image of a stopwatch being used to measure the 30 meter sprint test. Again, we've talked about the fact that they can use electronic gates, so the reliability of the timing is all based on a human pressing the stopwatch at the correct time, whereas some athletes will use timing gates, which uses technology, which is often more reliable in these circumstances. We also need to think about whether the tests actually measure what they're intending to do so. So take the hand grip dynamometer, for example. This is here to measure strength, but does it actually measure whole body strength or is it purely just measuring grip strength? And how important is that to, let's say, a rugby player? Talking about the body composition tests, a lot of those tests don't take account of muscle and how much muscle weighs and also the size of muscle. If you are more muscular, you're generally going to weigh more. And equally, if you are more muscular, 
you are going to have bigger areas of your body, such as on the arms and around the chest. So again, that can skew some of these results. We also need to take into account the environment that the tests are being carried out and the equipment that the athletes are using. So if you are doing the 30 metre sprint test or you are doing the 12 minute Cooper run, is this on a track? Is it on grass? Are people wearing spikes or are they wearing trainers or are they wearing boots? Because each of these different factors can influence the results. And we also need to make sure that the people who are measuring these tests, we already talked about the stopwatch, but setting the actual tests up, have they measured the correct distances? Are people using a 400 metre running track when it comes to the Cooper run? When setting out the Illinois Agility run, are all the cones spaced the correct part placed apart? All these things need to be accounted for when taking part in fitness tests. Now, we've talked about why people would fitness test, but I just want to show you how this would be worked in a personal exercise program. Because a personal exercise program is something that you are going to do as part of your coursework at the end of year 10. So let's take this netballer for example. She will carry out fitness tests for all of the above reasons. So let's say she's carried out all the fitness tests that are on the screen here. She will then have got a set of results which can be compared to normative data. As you can clearly see here, the Cooper 12 minute run and the vertical jump were either below average or poor, which indicates that her cardiovascular endurance and her lower leg power were not at the correct level. What the athlete can then do is design a specific training program aimed at improving those weaknesses. So the training program would work on cardiovascular endurance and power. The hope being that in six weeks time, when she redoes these tests, we've noted an improvement. And the example here shows that her cardiovascular endurance has moved from poor to average and her lower body power has gone from below average to above average. That will hopefully allow the netball player to have improved their overall game because she'll be able to last longer and hopefully by improving her lower leg power she'll be able to jump higher and further which would be of huge benefit to a netball player. So let's see if we now know more and remember more. Can you explain the various different reasons why athletes use fitness tests and what benefits it can bring to a personal exercise program. Can you match and identify what fitness tests are used to measure the different components and explain how these should be carried out? And lastly, can you discuss the various different reasons why fitness test protocols must be followed in order to ensure the reliability of the results is as good as it can be? Thank you for listening. Hopefully you know more and remember on fitness tests and I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.